As queen, Victoria was the most powerful woman in the world. She never let her children forget it. She could control the younger ones living with her, but it was different with her eldest son, the Prince of Wales, Bertie. I think the relationship between Victoria and Bertie really was something that was um, extremely painful and difficult on both sides. And they really didn't like one another at all. The rebellious 24-year-old Bertie was the very opposite of his father, Prince Albert. Bertie was always a pleasure lover. He was weighted down by, uh, by the responsibilities of, of the card table, of, uh, of the champagne bottle, and of the, of the cigar. Victoria hated smoking and banned it in her palaces, accusing Bertie of puffing away in a state of dreamy idleness. At Buckingham Palace, to prevent Bertie sneaking off for a quick cigar, the Queen even had rooms locked. I mean, in a sense, this is a rebellion against, well, both of his parents, against the sort of the virtuousness and the dreariness of the court of Queen Victoria. When his father, Prince Albert, was alive, he had banned gambling at the palace and rationed the wine. But when Bertie moved into Marlborough House in central London, he was set on making the most of his newfound freedom and life of pleasure. He wrote to a friend coming to stay. The sinful practice of smoking will be carried out in my house. The more you smoke, the better I will be pleased. Victoria had this idea that Bertie was going to be the social sovereign and to be the sort of leader of London society, and that he was going to set an example of good behavior. But, I mean, anything more unlikely than that Bertie should have led a moral example. It was an extraordinary sort of self-delusion that Victoria thought this should happen. The Marlborough House set is kind of where all the action is, and they're always having parties, and they take up the sort of mantle of being social leaders. Bertie takes an almost childish delight in staying up really late and playing cards or just drinking and talking. All the things that Victoria disapproved of. But nothing would stop Bertie. The more his mother complained, the more he parted. Victoria despaired of him. He shows more and more how totally, totally unfit he is for ever becoming a king. Soon, it would be all-out war between the Queen and her children, but there would only be one winner. Victoria might not have approved of Bertie, but she did like his beautiful wife, Alexandra, who was soon producing children. Even so, the Queen couldn't stop herself finding fault in her new grandchildren's appearance. Miserable, puny children. I can't tell you how these poor, frail little fairies distress me. The glamorous Alexandra, though, was the Princess Diana of her day. On the surface, they were the model family. The reality was very different. Bertie was incredibly unfaithful to Alex, really from a, quite early on in the marriage. He seems to have felt that his wife being pregnant, which she was often at this time, licensed him to go off with other women. He was a sort of serial molester of other people's wives. He had mistresses. He never managed to kick that habit, even when he was married. He was constantly going to brothels. In Paris, he'd had special furniture made for him so that he could perform sexual acts with two women at once, sitting on a chair, and so on and so forth. Um, it wasn't necessarily particularly charming. To make matters worse, Bertie was starting to lead astray his younger brother, Prince Affy. The 21-year-old Affy had already disgraced himself in his mother's eyes over an affair with a prostitute in Malta whilst he was in the Navy. Now the princes were going to the same London parties, chasing the same actresses and women. In desperation, Victoria bombarded Bertie with letters. The frivolity, the love of pleasure, self-indulgence, luxury and idleness, it is, dear child, in your willpower to do much to check this.
What Victoria couldn't see as she headed north to Balmoral, her estate in the Scottish Highlands, was that in her own way, she was behaving almost as badly as her wayward sons. Balmoral was a zone of allowed pleasure for her. And that was partly because of the presence of John Brown. It was a very powerful relationship. Brown became more important to her than the relationships with her children. My beloved John would say, you haven't a more devoted servant than Brown. And oh, how I felt that. Afterwards, so often I told him that no one loved him more than I did, or had a better friend than me, and he answered, nor you than me. No one loves you more. It wasn't long before the whispering started in the corridors of the palaces. Staff sneered at Queen Victoria. They called her Mrs. Brown. And her children called John Brown Mama's lover. The children hated Brown because he'd got into their mother's heart, really, uh, in a way that perhaps none of them really ever did. He actually became like this kind of security guard at the door, not allowing her own children into the room to see her when they wanted to go in. And he became so incredibly protective of her to the point of arrogance and being really quite dictatorial. The children all were appalled by this and they hated it. They found it extremely offensive. The children only had themselves to blame, as it was second daughter Alice who had originally suggested bringing the rough, uneducated Brown down from Scotland to Osborne House. She thought it would be good if Brown helped to get the Queen out on her pony again. They were sick of their mother sitting, grieving, obsessing indoors the whole time, refusing to do anything. And bit by bit, you know, he brought a little bit of joy back into her life. The problem for the children was that their mother's relationship had developed into more than just innocent pony rides. I'm sure he was the first man to touch her after Albert died. And if you imagine that she's in this world of grief and then suddenly a strong, handsome man helps you onto your pony or whatever it is, it must have made a huge impact on her, I think. Brown lifted her spirits, and it was because he was able to talk to her directly. He understood how heartbroken she was, but at the same time, they could come back. They could get half plastered, drinking whiskey together. Nobody, nobody had that relationship with her, so it was very liberating for her, but very excluding for everybody else. John Brown has the ability to cut through all the sort of layers of court protocol that surround the Queen and to talk to her in a very direct way. He seemed to show no deference to her at all. He called her woman. Equally, Brown showed no respect for the royal children, and one of them, Princess Louise, had good reason to dislike him. Princess Louise famously described John Brown as an absurd man in a kilt. She felt very angry at the fact that she felt he was spying on her. She felt that he was a spy for her mother, and she really resented him. He used to carry her around in his arms. The level of intimacy was embarrassing to everybody to watch. And of course, this was why she liked him and why everybody else hated him, and he was extremely rude. Victoria's seventh child, Prince Arthur, particularly disliked Brown. When arriving at Balmoral, he made a point of shaking the hands of all the Highland servants, with one exception, John Brown. The Queen was furious. The children, I think, began to see him as a kind of cuckoo um, who was displacing them. All of the children felt that John Brown had far too much ascendancy in their lives. Bertie wrote to Louise describing him as a brute at one point. He was not the kindly character that he's been portrayed as in film. He was, I think, a deeply unpleasant man. It really became very contentious when she would go off to her little bothy up in the hills and only take a lady in waiting and John Brown with her. And there was all kinds of rumor and gossip going on about it. Victoria couldn't care less about the gossip. She was happy in Brown's company and no one else's. <laughs> <laughs> 